Անուն հոր եվ որդվո եվ ոգույն սրպո ամեն սիրելի հավադացյալներ, այսօր մեր է գեղեց ոդունացուսին համացայն դնդեսի գիրագին է, ասինք նախորդող գիրագիներում թե մեծ բակի ամի մեկ գիրագին ձանոտ է իր անունով, ասկսան Եվ մենք տշպաղթապար այդ պարի գյանքին հարկը չի կիտնալով ու գործնցնենք ձայն։ Եվ հաչորդ գիրագին գոչվի արդակսման գիրագի, այսենք են մենք տուրս կել ենք տրախտեն մեր հանցանքին բաճարով։ Երորդ Աստված գնմանի այն հորը, որ առագի մեջ տեսանք, որ ծերքերը պած գնդունի իր զավագը, որ սխալ ճամպաներու մեջ էր։ Իսկ այսօր գոչվի դնդեսի գիրագի, դնդեսի գիրագին արնված է ուգասու ավետարանեն մեր դիրոչիսուս Եվ հարուստ մարդը ասիգա իմանալով գանչեց իրքով դնդես եվ սա, որ հաշիվ դուր կուքոր ձրութ, ասկե վերջտուն դնդեսը շչես կնարլալ։ Եվ կանի որ աս մարդը ճարբի գեր, գանչեց պոլոր անոնք, որոնք բարդ կունեին դերը իմացավ ինչ կվադահի, կովեց դնդեսը, որով էդև դնդեսը մդածեց, եթե հատպես անեմ, կոնե եվ աստեղ են թուրս կամ, ուրիշ տեղ բիդի երթամ և ուրիշ տեղ կործ բիդի կտնեմ։ Առաջին դբավորությունը չնչեց այդ մեկ պաժինը բարդք են հավանապար իր պաժինն էր, որ գչնչեր, անգտերան կմիշն գսենք չէ, հավանապար մարդը իր կմիշն էր, որ չնչեց, որվեսի ամե մարդ ուրախը լա, անոք որոնք բարդք ունեին, ուրախացան Եվ որ վարբետի իրեն թուրս նդե բիդի երթա և ուրիշ տեղ կործ բիդի կտնե։ Հիսուս այս առագը գեզրագացն է սելով, որ շահակործեցեք ծերզի դրված արիտները, որբես է ասուզո դա մեջ դեղ կտնեք։ Ասիկա Աշխարի մեջ, ուր որ գաբրինք, մենք արիտներ ունինք և ադ արիտները բետք է ոգտակործենք, ոչ թե մի է միան մենք մեզի շահ և հարստություն և հանքիստ աբահովելու համար, բայց պետ է գաբրինք ամբիսի գյանքմը, որ Հարուստ մարդ մգար, որ կեղեցիք հակուսներ գահակվեր, հանքիստ կաբրել իր դունի մեջ, և իր դունին արջավը մեկատ աղկատ մեր պարերով հոմլես մարդ մգար, վերքեր ուներ մարմին վրա, շուներ ու կային գլիզ էին, ու դելու հատ չուներ պարը, որ գտեսնենք տժողքի մեջ հարուստը գայր էր և գտեսնե իր թուրի արջևի հոմլեսը, որ հանքի ստեղը և գսկսի աղա արգել, որ կիչ մչուր դվեք ինձ ես ոս գայրիմ, ապրահամ գսը, որ թունգի անքիտ մեջ հանք Եվ ապրահամ գսա անունք որենք ունին մարկարաներ ունին, եթե անունց հետևին ուրիշպան մներու վետ չունին, որը դետե մերելներեն ալ մեկը կա, իրենք թարձյալ բիտի չի լսեն։ 
Աս օրինակը շատ կարևոր է սիրելն է, որ դե մենք մեր կյանքի մեջ ամեն մեկս աղկատ ղազորոս մը ունինք տեղմը։ Այսինքն ամեն մեկս արիտ մը ունինք, որ ուրիշներուն ոգնենք։ Ասված մեզի պարկաս բայց խորքի մեջ ասուզո այդ մեր հարապերությունը երեկ ուղություն ունեցող հարապերությունը, թրի դայմենշն, մենք եվ ասված և մենք եվ մեր չորս գողմինները։ Եթե մենք եվ մեր չորս գողմիներու հարապերությունը լավ չ այդ շնորքին մեջ մնալ։ Ըգտակործենք ժամանագը, դեսնենք թե ինչ արիտներ ունինք և այդ արիտները ոգտակործելով մոտ են անկասուզո։ Dear brothers and sisters, good morning and welcome to St. Sarkis Church. I'm so happy to see all of you here today. It is the season of Lent and we are continuing to read the Gospel of Matthew. I'm sure most of you know that we are doing a biblical study of the Gospel of Matthew, and today is the fourth Sunday. We're a little bit over halfway through, um, and today we will be discussing the third discourse, the parables of the kingdom. I'm so happy that today we have with us His Grace Bishop Anush Avantanelian, our Vicar General, who is praying with us and presiding over the services. For those who would like to uh, follow with us, we will be reading from the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. In this chapter, we read about John the Baptist. The last time we read about John the Baptist was when he was arrested and he was taken to be imprisoned. He was arrested because he was very vocal. He said things about the king and the sinful relationship that the king was indulging. Subsequently, he was imprisoned. And now, from the prison, John the Baptist sends messengers, or his disciples, to go and to ask Jesus the following very important question. Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? And when the, when the disciples come and ask Jesus this question, this very important question, Jesus tells them the following, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind regain their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised. So, it could have been a simple yes or no answer, but Jesus does not give that. He gives a resume of what he is doing. Now we might say, is Jesus bragging? No, Jesus is not bragging. Jesus is telling what is happening because he wants to show that he is fulfilling whatever has been predicted in the scriptures about him. He is the fulfillment of the messianic time. And the examples that Jesus gave is about the times of the Messiah coming and being with the people, taking away their pain, creating a perfect environment that is mirroring the kingdom of God. But I, I think the most important question that we need to ask ourselves should be the following. Why John sent messengers to go and ask Jesus if he was the Messiah? Because we read a few chapters ago that he was the one who baptized him. He just witnessed that when Jesus was being baptized, the sky opened. The Holy Spirit came in the shape of the dove. A voice from heaven was heard that this is my son. He was sure that he was the Messiah. But what happened? Could it be that in the darkness of his prison cell, he was second-guessing everything? He was having doubts? Well, as human beings, we all go through that. We all experience moments where our faith is shaken. When we, the things that we take for granted become questionable. Could it have been that? 
Or it could have been that John was very much aware of what kind of demise he was expecting. He knew that in that prison cell, his life would be over. And we know how he was executed in that prison cell. And probably he was preparing his disciples that my part soon will be over. And the next thing for you is to go and follow Jesus. When Jesus dismisses the disciples of John, he gives a testimony about John. He asks a very rhetoric question. Why did you go to the desert? What, what were you expecting to see when you went to the desert? And let me remind you, a lot of people were going to the desert where, where John was preaching. They wanted to be baptized. They wanted to get ready to see or to meet the Messiah. And he answers his rhetorical question saying, did you go to see a reed swayed by the wind? What's the meaning of this word? A reed swayed by the wind. Jesus is, give, is giving a testimony about John. And he's saying that John was not a people's pleaser. He was a very solid person. And he is praising that character in his personality. He was not a man who was dressed like princes because he did not care to impress people. He was there and he had a very clear mission. And Jesus reminds everyone what was his mission by quoting the scriptures. And he says, Behold, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. Two pieces of scripture are put together. One is from the book of Exodus, reminding his listeners the promise that God gave to the people as they were getting out of the land of Egypt and heading towards the promised land. In other words, Jesus was saying that what John was doing was preparing the people to go to that promised land, the kingdom of heaven with the Messiah. And the second part, which is taken from Malachi, is to show us that Jesus, I mean, John was preparing his people to meet the Lord. So John's role was, was very important. And we hear or we see in this part, Jesus giving homage to his cousin. They, they were related. But the great prophet John but it doesn't stop there, because Jesus encourages us. On one hand, he praises the work of John. And on the other hand, he says that any one of you who accept the message of the kingdom, you will be like John. You will be treated like John. And that's a great promise for us. It shows us that we don't have to be super human beings. All we need to do is open our hearts and accept the message of salvation that Jesus is bringing. When we continue reading chapter 11, we come to see Jesus reprimanding certain times, times where he preached enormously, but he was rejected. And Jesus is frustrated with that because it is the old saying that goes something like this, with great privilege com comes great responsibility. When somebody is constantly has heard the word of God, there are certain expectations. We are like that. We are here, we are hearing the word of God. We come to church, we get the Holy Eucharist, and God is with us. We are expected to change our lives to live a different life so that that grace which God has given to us becomes a living reality. When we continue in chapter 11, 25 through 30, we hear Jesus praying. And the way that he prays is very consistent. He starts his prayer with the words, Father. In Aramaic, it is Abba. 
The idea of Father or Abba was not foreign in the scriptures, but it was Jesus who made that his personal prayer, and he invited us to embrace that style of prayer. He introduced that intimacy between us and God. And that's the great way that teaches us how to pray. God is not an alien foreign power. God is our heavenly Father. And we need to imitate the example of Jesus, to go to him with confidence and to open our hearts and say, Father. However, this prayer is very unique. In this prayer, Jesus thanks the Father that his message was not given to the wise and the learned, but it was given to the simple people, to the childlike people. It sounds like the idea of being sophisticated, it's not an idea that is only present today. Back in the day, there were some people who considered themselves to be very sophisticated. And subsequently, they rejected the message of God. Sometimes we tend to think that we are too cool, too sophisticated, to believe in things that were said 2,000 years ago. What God ha has to do with my own personal choices? How is that relevant in my life? And we try to find ways to reject the word of God. Sometimes we know we do, we do all of that because sometimes we are personally hurt. Sometimes we have struggles. We're trying to make choices that we know are not the right choices. But the best way for us to reject the word of God is to start doubting the authenticity of the word of God. What Jesus wants us to do is to be childlike and accept the faith like children do. It's not an easy thing. But when we have that childlike faith, our relationship is totally changed. He invites us to have a personal and a rewarding relationship with him. He promises us that when we go to him, he will comfort us. He will give us the spiritual comfort, which all of us need. Let me ask you a question. How many people in this crowd has no problems in their lives? I have a lot of problems personally, and my assumption is that all of us have problems. In life, all of us struggle to find solutions to the problems. But Jesus says, come to me all who are labored, and I will give you rest. Somebody's cheering my sermon, by the way, and I'm very excited about that. <laughs> Thank you. But that, <laughs> but that spiritual rest that Jesus promises is not, is not effortless. It's not cheap. Because Jesus is telling us, take upon you my yoke. What is a yoke? A yoke was a beam that back in the day they would put on the back of the animal and the animal will walk and they will plow the earth with, with the power that the yoke and the animals will produce. To have a yoke on the animal's shoulder, that was a very uncomfortable position for them. But Jesus says, take my yoke, for my yoke is light. It means that when we go and say yes to Jesus, our life will not become effortless. There are certain things that we will need to do to follow that path. But Jesus promises two things. He promises to give us spiritual comfort, and he promises us that that yoke that will be placed on our shoulders is a light one, is a bearable one. So how are we doing? How bored are you right now? <coughs> Scale zero to 10. Should I continue? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to cut it short. I know we have a lot to cover today. Um, it's a very ambitious 
schedule I have made, but I'm going to try to cut it short. In Matthew 12, we see the tension between the Pharisees and Jesus reaching to a new level. Last week we said the tension got to a point where the Pharisees accused Jesus of having or working with Satan. The miracles that he was performing were happening because he was affili affiliated with Satan. Today, we come to see that the, that hostility comes to a brand new level. It, it starts when Jesus was in the fields with his disciples, and the disciples break the law. They start picking up the wheat from the fields, and they start to eat. And the Pharisees, when they see that, they cannot tolerate that. Observing the Sabbath was a very important tradition. But it was not a personal, an, a, an issue of personal piety. It was a matter of national security. And let me tell you why. Because in Jeremiah, we read that the people were taken out from their land and they were taken into captivity because they failed to fulfill God's law. They failed to observe the Sabbath and subsequently they were punished. So the Pharisees have taken upon themselves to enforce that everyone follows the law of God so that nothing like that would ever happen to them. But we see that the disciples of Jesus are breaking the law and the Pharisees come and ask Jesus about what is happening. Jesus does not argue with them, but he gives them two examples from the Old Testament. That in the past, there have been times where the law were broken. One, when David was a refugee and he was hungry and there was no food for him, he went, he went straight to the temple and he ate the bread that was designated for the priests. And he also mentions about the work that the priests do in the temple on the Sabbath. And that is not considered to be dishonoring the Sabbath. And the conclusion of this discussion is the following. There is something greater than the temple amongst you. Jesus comes to declare that he is more important than the temple. He is more important than anything else. And remember, if this was happening in the 30s, and we know a few decades after that, that temple was going to be destroyed. And we know no one would be able to go back and to worship God, where God has revealed himself so many times in that place in the temple. We know that through Jesus, people would come to know God and establish a relationship with God. The Pharisees do not like what Jesus says, and they plot to kill him. Subsequently, Jesus changes his way of teaching, and he goes from public preaching into telling parables. We're going to skip a few stories here, and we're going to go all the way to Matthew chapter 13, where we see a set of parables that Jesus gives. Jesus changes his styles because there is clear understanding. There are certain people who are following him wholeheartedly, and there are others who are rejecting him. And with these parables, the parables of the good soil versus the bad soil, the parable of the weed and the weeds, Jesus is teaching us that you have to pick your side. Which side are you on? Because in the parable of the soil, we know that every grain of wheat that falls anywhere apart or away from the good soil, they did not produce any kinds of fruit. It was only the ones that fell into the rich soil that produced soil, produced grains. So it's, it becomes very clear. We are either on Jesus' side or we are somewhere else. 
And when we choose to be on Jesus' side, our life will not be a problem-free life or a challenge-free life. Because in the next parable, he teaches us about, or he gives the parable of the good seeds that are planted into the soil, but then the enemy coming and putting the bad seeds in there. And Jesus tells them, let them grow together. That is our greatest challenge, to choose to be on the side of Jesus and to coexist with all the bad things that is around us. When we read this parable, we are always thinking that we are the good seed and we are living in a place where everything else is bad, right? But sometimes we are the bad things that is trying to choke other people's life. It's very difficult for us to accept that, but that's the reality. But the good news is that God is always giving us a second chance, a third chance. Until the end of times, God is giving us a chance to change our lives. But there's one more thing. At the end of this series of parables, Jesus tells the following story. He says that the kingdom of heaven is like someone who discovers a treasure in a field. He goes and he sells everything that he has, and he comes and he buys that property where he had discovered the treasure. This means that when we discover that our faith, the relationship with God, is something valuable, is something important, then we have to make an investment. Just like the guy who sold everything and he purchased that property. We need to take a look at our lives. Try to see what are the things that are distracting us. And in our lives, when we examine ourselves, we know that we have a lot of junk, a lot of things that keep us away from God. Jesus is asking us to do that self-examination. Get rid of the things that are distracting you. Embrace a life of contemplation, prayer, and let God be the center of your lives. I'm going to end here. Thank you very much for bearing with me. I know this was very difficult for you, but I appreciate that. We will continue next week. We have two more sessions to finish the Gospel of Matthew.